What I will try within the next 20 minutes is, in a nutshell, give you a kind of summary of what we know and what we are still questioning. So, how big is the problem? Despite the, the vast improvements in therapy, the increasing also acceptance of stopping smoking, it is still the second most frequent cause of cancer. And it's still the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, with 20% of all cancer deaths. Still, we have the problem that only 16% of the tumors are diagnosed in an early stage and 70% in an incurable stage. Since more than 20 years, we are busy with lung cancer screening studies. And here I differentiated between the so-called statistically powered studies, and everybody is now familiar with the big American NLST trial and the Dutch-Belgium Nelson trial, and I will show you more details. And then there is a whole number of mainly uh, European trials, statistically unpowered studies, but the purpose, purpose of this talk is also to show you that these studies actually taught us a lot of details. So the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial published in the New England in 2011 was the first, largest, first and largest randomized controlled trial who actually showed with a 90% statistical power that lung cancer sc uh, that screening with low dose as compared to a chest radiographic arm did not only found more lung cancers but also led to a 20% uh, reduction in lung cancer re related mortality. And actually, they had to stop, or they stopped the, the trial a little bit earlier because that was reached earlier than expected. The second statistically powerful uh, study was the Dutch-Belgium trial, the Nelson trial. And here we have, um, they had a control arm uh, without any imaging intervention. And then they had the screening arm using low CT. And similarly, as the big NLST trial, they found a statistically significant cancer-related reduction of mortality. And in this particular trial, it was by 24%. And this trial was also characterized by the fact that the majority of the included subjects were male. Already after the first publication, um, political consequences were taken, and in 2015, the screening was endorsed by a whole number of professional societies in the US. It is um, a, a range for a population-based screening. It is financially reimbursed, but we also are aware of the fact that the uptake is still very variable. Um, in Europe, we are still behind. There are a whole number of pilot studies, but there is not a single country in Europe thus far who really is advocating a, a population-based, broad, countrywide screening. <coughs> Lung cancer screening, what else did we learn besides the statistically significant reduction of mortality? Um, there is a difference of the effect of screening for the men and the women. And these are the data from the Nelson trial, and you do see that for the women, it was at least double, in certain years even up to three times a higher mortality reduction as compared to the men. And this was not only a finding seen in the Nelson trial, this was also seen in the NLST trial and in the German Lucy trial. And what is the underlying reason for that? It is very likely the different lung tumor subtypes in men and women, the different distribution. Here are data from the German Lucy trial, and we do see, uh, do see here the low-dose um, CT screening arm, and this is the control arm. We see that in both, we have a majority of adenocarcinomas, but here we see it for the men and here for the women, that especially the gaining, the number of adenocarcinomas in the screening arm is much larger in the woman, uh, female population as compared to the male population. Here we lo are looking at the uh, 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 data from the uh, uh, Danish uh, screening trial, and we see here the absolute numbers, and here we see the relative numbers for low stage and high stage. And it has to, we see here that not only the low stage cancers, but also the high stage cancers were found in a higher number. But more importantly, the relative number of low stage cases, low stage uh, cancers was much higher in the screening arm as compared to the control arm. So more high stage and low stage cancers were found, but relatively much more low stage cancers. So we learned thus far, lung cancer screening has a greater benefit in women. It detects mainly adenocarcinomas, so that is linked to each other, and it brings forward early disease. 
How long should we screen? These are again data from the German Lucy trial, and we are here looking only at the number of advanced stages. This is screening round one and two, and we have here the, um, uh, the screening arm and the control arm, and we see there is not a big difference in the first round, not a big difference in the second round. The difference only steps in, comes in, in the third, fourth, and fifth year. Because in the first rounds, we see equally a lot of advanced cancer stages. And it, it takes the time that they have been selected out, and that pass, uh, after um, year three or four, we come into the range that we see more low-stage cancers, and that is then the statistical base also for the, the uh, mot uh, reduction of mortality. This is just the same way how to show this. This is the Lucy trial, and that it does take, first the curves are going parallel, and it does take a while that there is a disparation between the control arm and the screening arm. This was not only seen in the Lucy trial, that also was seen here in the NLST trial, that it does take a while, round two and three, that the effect of screening really kicks off. This was actually the first publication um, using data from the MILD trial that a longer, here up to 10 year follow up is very useful. They did find after this long follow up and longer screening, a uh, reduction risk of lung cancer mortality from, of, by, of almost 40%. So even extending the uh, 20 or 24% uh, I uh, described already to you. And there was a 20% reduction of overall mortality. So actually for the first time it was published that prolonged screening beyond five years can enhance the benefit of early detection and achieve a greater overall, uh, overall and lung cancer mortality reduction compared with the NLST trial. How long does this protection last? And we have here data from the Nelson trial, um, and it showed that the protection lasted up to 2.5 years. In the NLST trial, it was actually 3.5 years. And then the curve it, it, uh, become a little bit going more parallel here, as you can see in both curves. So less desperation between screening and controller. Should we screen live long? You know that in the US, the recommendation of annual screening have been extended to 80 years. It is covered, financially covered, up to 77 years. But, and I think that is very important, screening is not advised for those with limited life expectancy due to significant comorbidities. So we come into the discussion between uh, uh, the lung cancer risk and competing risk, mainly cardiovascular risk. Screening interval annual versus B annual, and there have been also uh, 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 some discussions here during the conference already. NLST used an annual screening. Nelson, there was one interval of up to 2.5 years. Actually, it was then published that with, with, with this longer interval, there was a significant increase of interval cancers. The MILD trial was the only trial, the Italian uh, trial, to systematically uh, went into an annual versus biannual screening, and they didn't find a statistically significant difference. And there are a number of publications now who model the whole thing. So they do that mathematically to find a balance between the risk on one side and the cost effectiveness on the other side. And what is increasingly discussed is that we have to go away from fixed delay times, not one year, two year, 2.5 years, but we have to do a baseline, have a risk assessment, and do a more, uh, try to find an individual risk assessment and then determine the, the optimal delay time. What is the ideal target population? You know that the uptake in the US is not far below what we would, what, what we would say is optimal. The problem is also that it is a little bit of stigmatization by the society. Only cancer blamed, um, uh, 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 this is the only cancer who is blamed actually on, on the patients themselves, on their behavior. And we have to be aware of the fact that 20% have never smoked and 60% are former smokers who actually develop cancer. So it is also for the acceptance of lung cancer screening very important that we have a good, um, generally acceptable target population, which is also um, optimal for the risk-benefit analysis. Of course, smoking is and remains the main risk factor. So if you go to the highest smoker rates here, screening 60% of the highest risk subjects prevents 88% of the lung cancer deaths. But as I said, there are other uh, criteria to take into consideration. 
And one criteria is, for example, this year, this is a retrospective study with patients who developed lung cancer, population-based, and there's a certain selection bias, but it does show you, if we take the screening criteria originally taken from the NLST trial, 55 to 80 years, more than 30 uh, pack years, then less and less and less patients um, actually who developed cancer would be fit into these selection criteria. This, ha this has to do that less patients smoke, different uh, other, other risk factors develop. There are a number of um, models available how to assess the selection group. Um, the NLST only used uh, pack years and age. The Nelson group also used only pack years and age, uh, slightly different because here they included also less risky patients. But, and this is going, this is the tendency today is that we use more complex models who not only take age and smoking history, but also other factors into the consideration, for example, the PLCO or the LLP, Liverpool um, criteria, and that, of course, they are more effective, that has been shown already in several publications, but they also in introduce a little bit more complexity. It's not only age and smoking history, but also BMI, COPD, family history, education, and so on. Reducing disparities in lung cancer screening. It's not so black and white. I actually like that. You know that the US task force recommendation changed in 2020, and one reason was that there was a huge disparity. We do have a less problem of that, but in the US the problem was big, uh, a lot of larger. There was a disparity between the black and white population. So they have now new criteria, age 50, 20 pack years, up to 80 years, which is covered up to the age of 77. This would mean a 15% increase in numbers, meaning 6.5 million more people would be eligible. That is a huge number. However, they calculated that the increase of prevented deaths in the white population would go up from 55 to 67, so very good. It would go up only, in quotation marks, from 30 to 40 in the Asian population and from 41 to 54 in the black population. So. It is a step into the right direction, but still not yet a solution. In summary, I think we have sufficient evidence that it works. It works in women better than in men, and there are some racial differences. However, there are still also, also some open ends. The criteria for screening elig eligibility, the screening interval with question mark individualization, when to stop, uh, competing risk players in increasing role, how to increase the screening uptake, and there are a lot of very good tendencies how to do that in terms of communication, in terms of going to the risk population, and then the whole role of administrative issues with the central registry, quality, quality control, and screening uptake. Cost effectiveness is related to prevalence of lung cancer, cost of low dose CT for screening, proportion of only lung cancers, and the combination with smoking cessation. And cost reduction can only be reached by an individualized follow-up, high throughput, and automation. And this is my last slide. There are some positive side effects also of these uh, so-called statistically underpowered uh, screening studies. We learned a lot and accumulated a lot of knowledge um, also about the CT manifestations of early lung cancer. It provided information important for guidelines for managing pulmonary nodules. There's an, in, or was an increased impetus to reduce radiation dose in CT, and it fostered tremendously the development of automated and quantitative analysis techniques. Thank you very much.